Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, May 5th. Our special guest is Sarah Malchow, and her topic is Global Collaboration Through Online Experiences. I'm one of the co-moderators, Lori Moffat, along with Peggy George, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning. And I'm turning the mic over to Peggy, who will introduce Sarah and ask her the newbie question. Well, hello, and welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us today. I have had the privilege of getting to know Sarah Malchow over the past few weeks as we've worked together on preparation for today's webinar. And it has been such an honor. She is amazing, and you're about to find out. We're thrilled to have her here with us today to share her passions and her ideas for integrating technology and most specifically as it relates to global collaboration with online experiences. Sarah is a passionate and connected educator who really believes that technology integration in the primary grades is crucial to creating 21st century global citizens. We can't start too young. As a first grade teacher in Pulaski, Wisconsin, Sarah provided her students with many opportunities to connect and collaborate beyond the four walls of their classroom. Last year, Sarah stepped out of the classroom and is now in a new role as an elementary digital learning specialist in the Pulaski School District, which is in northeast Wisconsin, where she's been able to bring her love of technology integration and global collaboration to many classrooms and not just her own. She serves on the district coding committee and is also a member of her district's Apple Core technology training team. Sarah is the creator of Epic Pals. If you don't know about that, you will after today's session. It is a monthly collaborative reading project for kindergarten through fourth grade students. And she also puts out a weekly newsletter for teachers called Mal Malchow's Tech Bites. I get excited every time my tech bites arrive in the mail, and I love getting these new tips and resources every week. Sarah is also the new host of the annual St. Patrick's Day Lucky Charms Global Graphing Project. She's an Apple Distinguished Educator, a member of the Copernicus Ed Idea Lab, a Seesaw and Book Creator Ambassador, Epic Master Teacher, and as a Google Certified Educator. She's presented at numerous local, state, and national conferences, and she is always excited to connect and learn with others. So welcome, Sarah, and thank you so much for sharing with us today. And I'd like to ask you to answer our newbie question. <clears throat> And then you can take over with your answer and your presentation. So today, to get us started, share with us why you think it's important for students and teachers to connect, to connect globally with others around the world. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Hearing you great. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Peggy, for that wonderful introduction. Much appreciated. Um, I am super excited to be here today and to share um, what I am so very, very passionate about. So um, starting off with the newbie question, for me, um, it, it goes both along the lines of me personally as well as what I feel students need. Um, I work in Plasky, Wisconsin, as Peggy had mentioned, which is about 20 minutes outside of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Go Packers! And um, the district I'm in is a little bit more rural, and the diversity is um, not very significant in our district. So for me, opening my classroom doors globally has allowed me um, and my students to create meaningful connections and de to develop better understanding um, about the world. So first graders, if any of you have talked to youngers, are very much in the moment, and for them to realize that children outside of our area really are no different than they are has brought new appreciation to them um, to different world events going on. 
Um, for example, a few years back, there were some terrible tornadoes in Texas. And at that time, we were connecting with a class in that area, and their town was not far from um, the area that was impacted by that. My students had seen it on the news, had come in the next morning, and they were concerned about the well-being um, of the class that we were connecting with. So for first graders to see those things and put those pieces together uh, was truly, truly amazing and really opened my eyes to how much global connections um, can really bring in the classroom, even at the younger ages. Personally, um, I was a one-to-one -one iPad classroom about seven, actually probably more than that, maybe nine years ago. Um, and at the time, I was looking for anybody else that was in that boat along with me, just trying to reach out and, and kind of, kind of, you know, tread through the waters, if you will, because it was new at that time and, and was really struggling. And Twitter was where I ended up going to try and find those connections. And since then, it's been nothing but amazing. It's been a wonderful ride. It's made me a better teacher being able to connect out. Um, networking with others and learning from them it truly has been a game teacher, game changer, excuse me, in, in how I teach. I've learned so much from, from so many others and not just locally, but um, you know, around the U.S. as well as around the world. It, it just never ceases to amaze me what a small world it truly, truly is um, when you start reaching out. Um, in fact, this summer I have been a big, um, an active participant in the first chat on Twitter for many years as a first grade teacher and this summer, I'm planning to attend ISTE, and there are nine of us that um, are going to be rooming together, and we are all Twitter friends from my first grade chats, um, of which I think I have met maybe three of them face to face. So super, super excited about that and getting to take those connections further and actually meet people. So that's my tech geek side. My husband always laughs at me. So, um, so that said, I'm super excited, like I said, to be here today to talk with you a little bit about global collaboration um, through online experiences. The pieces that I'm going to share with you today, with the exception of one, are all things that I have participated in either with my first graders or um, pieces that I have um, brought and have been sharing with my teachers in the position that I'm in now. So super excited. If you have questions at the end about any of these, I'm happy, happy to answer those because, um, again, I, I do an experience firsthand with them as well. So. A little bit about me, just so you kind of know um, a little. Peggy already mentioned I am from Wisconsin. Um, if you look at Wisconsin and use your left hand and you see it kind of looks like a mitten, I'm kind of right down at the bottom of that thumb area there in Green Bay. Um, I'm married to a wonderful man and have uh, two children, an eighth grader and a fifth grader. So I'm uh, kind of stressing about the fact that I'm going to have a middle school and a high school kiddo next year. and It's kind of uh, making me realize that I'm not as young as I thought I was anymore. Uh, and then we also have a yellow lab. Uh, love to downhill ski and am a part of the running club here at the school that I teach at and I'm training kids for a 5K that's coming up in two weeks. So uh, it's been a busy run, these, no pun intended, these past few weeks with, with all of that. Um, professionally, um, Peggy mentioned a lot of these things already, so I won't go over all of them. Um, but previous to the position I'm in now, I taught first and second grade, and I was in the classroom for 19 years. So um, that part of me is still a big part of who I am. And I always tell the teachers that I work with now that um, if I ever lose that, lose that teacher side of me, then I don't need to be in this position any longer. So hopefully um, that stays with me for a long time. Um, it's, it's truly who I am. So um, I am a blogger. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about my blog a little bit later on. You'll find a lot of the resources that I'll be talking about today on my blog. So if you need to refer back to those areas and get more information, you can. Um, and I'm highly connected. So in that regard, too, um, even after today, if there are things that you're wondering, please feel free to reach out. I, I love connecting. And Peggy had mentioned that as well. So, so that being said, um, this is my blog. It's Digital Meanderings. If you Google it, you'll find it pretty quickly. Um, Otherwise, it is, there's a bit.ly link there for it, so you can access that. Um, and like I said, a lot of the resources from today will be there, and you'll, you'll find them as well. So uh, very passionate to me, technology in the position as um, a first grade teacher as well as the position I'm in now as a digital learning specialist. Uh, this is very tried and true for me that technology is not an event. It, it should be a part of everyday learning, truly finding those ways to embed technology into what we do, not to have it be something that we do at the end of a unit as a project, per se. Um, and that being said, there's a time and a place for that, too. But there's just so much more that's available 
um, for us taking it beyond those areas. So where does the magic happen? This is one of the things that really got me going, um, thinking about William Glasser's research and thinking about students and what they know and how they learn. And the two that I have arrows on there really are what got me going with connecting globally. 70% of what you discuss with others and 95% of what you teach others is what you retain and, and what you bring with you. Um, those are huge, huge percentages when you think about um, how many of our classrooms have been and how we are changing our classrooms. Global collaboration and connecting with others hits those areas in such a strong way. Um, you, you just, it, you need to do it. it, it honestly, I just, I can't say that enough. And I hope as we go through some things today, um, you'll dabble with some of those things, even if it's just that one item and you take a baby step into trying it. So there's also the question that I get from many people about why. Um, if you're not familiar with the ISTE standards that recently came out for students, um, this graphic shows you those particular standards. And as you can see, um, there are multiple standards that tie in with connecting globally. Uh, it's huge for digital citizenship, providing students with an authentic audience, which is just unbelievably amazing. So often when we have students turn things into us and we are their only audience, I personally found that the content and what they were able to provide to me wasn't near as good. But when they had that authentic audience, whether it was a class out on Twitter, whether it was a Google Hangout, um, whether it's connecting with parents and grandparents through Seesaw, which we now use, uh, the quality of what they now produce is so, so much better, and they're so excited about it as well. Um, problem solving and collaboration obviously fall into these areas as well and truly make up a great portion of why I, I connect globally as well. So there's also the when. You get the why, the how, the when, um, and truly the magic happens when you step out of your comfort zone. I am very much a rule follower. I'm very much that person that um, I like things a certain way. I kind of get, I don't want to say set in my ways. I'm always changing, but at the same time, it's that comfort piece. Um, even me leaving the classroom two years ago to come into my position was a, a big decision because I was very comfortable in what I was doing and loved what I was doing. Um, and this um, really was what took it for me to this next level. The magic truly happens when you step out of your comfort zone. And, and I've seen that time and time again, both in the classroom as well as in the position I'm in now, working with teachers and students. So take the jump, take the leap. Um, you'll be surprised, and trust me, you'll never look back. So that being said, um, I really want to share with you today some different opportunities that you can use to do that connecting with others. Um, there are really not in any particular order as far as um, what might be the easiest to tackle versus what is a little bit more, but I'll try to remember with each thing to just give you that little bit of a tidbit as we go. Peggy had mentioned that um, Epic Pals was something that I created and am running monthly. Um, as you see on the slide right now, Epic Pals is a collaborative reading project, and just a little history on it, it actually started as I was a first grade teacher, and I had several students that were reading at quite a bit higher reading level than um, the rest of my class, and I needed something for them. They, they were really past that point of needing to meet with me um, for decoding skills and such, really needed more with the, the collaboration and, and more that book talk. I always talked about it with the kids as kind of like Oprah's book talk, if you will. And um, it started out in the classroom as um, kids reading a book of interest to them that we would vote on, um, on Epic. And then from there, I would create a Padlet board for them. And on that Padlet board, they would then share um, whatever our, our topic was. We would always have um, some kind of a target, whether it was that we knew that good readers always ask questions while they read, and they would put questions on there. Maybe it was making connections to the stories, et cetera. But there was always some sort of a focus that tied it together. Um, from there, my students absolutely loved it. And from there, it went out to just a couple of classrooms that we were collaborating with at the time. There were, I think, three of us, if I remember correctly. Those students really enjoyed it as well. And at that point, it just took off into a, a whole global piece. So the way it is set up, and um, I believe that Peggy has shared the link out, and you can see more on my blog about it and have some areas that you can click into. But what I do each month is I choose five different books. Um, I should quickly mention, too, Bobby Hopkins from New York, and I actually have started to collaborate on this as of this year. 
Mine was always a primary based, being a first grade teacher. She contacted me, speaking of being globally connected, and said, hey, do you do an intermediate one too? And I'm, I'm like, no, it takes me about 10 hours a month to get this going. I, I really don't have the time nor the knowledge base for those third and fourth grade level books. Um, and she was a prior um, third grade teacher, if I remember correctly, and so she asked if she could jump on with me and take care of that part. So that being said, the two of us now are, are collaborating to put it together every month. Um, her pieces run the same way. We each choose five books every month. We try to do a um, combination of fiction and nonfiction. A padlet board is created to go with each book. And then from there, uh, what you are seeing on the right-hand side is the doc. It's a Google Doc that is set up so that teachers can simply print that Google Doc off for their students. Uh, both the primary and the intermediate are on the same doc. So if you need to multi-level right within your classroom, they are both there. You can print them at the same time. And then students read the book on Epic, and then they scan that QR code, and it takes them to a Padlet board. And then they can then um, answer whatever that question is. And then I also leave it very open-ended so that it can fit in with whatever the curriculum is that you are working on in your classroom. It isn't specific to students having to answer that exact question every month. Um, this year, I also brought on Flipgrid for um, the primary board, and I do one Flipgrid every month as well, really thinking about our younger learners that, um, you know, again, they can connect globally. It's a wonderful thing, but they may not have the reading and writing skills to be able to do that as independently, and Flipgrid has opened that up. So. Um, the book that goes along with Flipgrid is always a read-to-me book. So again, if their reading skills aren't there, they can listen to it. When they go on to Flipgrid then, it's all video-based, and so they don't have to do the writing piece. They can obviously just leave their video as to what their reflections are or wherever the question may be for that book, too. So really trying to bring it even to our youngest learners. It's been um, a phenomenal thing. It's, it's really taken off over the past couple of years. This is year three, if I remember correctly, that I've been doing this. So if you've not heard of it, um, by all means, please check it out. We'd love to have you on board. People often ask if you have to do all five books, and nope, you can pick and choose. You can do it in your guided reading group. You can assign it to students to do independently. Um, it might just be for some of your kiddos in class and not all. You could do it as a whole group as part of your read aloud if you wanted to. It, it truly is open-ended. It's just a way to bring that collaboration into the classroom and connecting. And quite honestly, it's a, it's a real simple, easy way to do so um, as well. Um, this is just uh, the, um, the Flipgrid board. Like I mentioned, every month there is one Flipgrid board for Epic Pals. There are times, too, for example, in March we were um, working with the Iditarod, and I sometimes will try to bring in something that is going on at that time, too. February, for example, is Groundhog Day. Um, April, last month, was amazing. There is a bald eagle um, webcam in Decorah, Iowa, and so I put the link in the Flipgrid, and students and teachers could go and watch that, and then part of the Flipgrid um, was talking about bald eagles and what they had learned about them. So just some different ways to connect outside of the classroom. Um, global Read Aloud, I know we had a guest a few weeks back that also spoke about the Global Read Aloud. Um, it is a fantastic um, way to connect with many, many others. If you are not familiar with it, Pernille Ripp is the one that started this. She's also a fellow Wisconsinite. Um, and what she does each year is finds a set of books for the elementary level, middle, and high school level as well. So this really is cross grade level. It runs for six weeks from October through mid-November. And um, she often states that you can take it to whatever level you want, whether it is that you just read those books you know, within your classroom environment or whether you truly let the magic happen and go global with it. Um, there are some phenomenal ways to do so, and she has a lot of resources. This past year, it was Mem Fox, who has a special place in my heart as a first grade teacher. We many times used her books. And so this year, um, I worked with my first grade classes in the buildings that I work in and had created a book creator template and then took it out and shared it beyond out on Twitter for others to um, utilize it as well. And then built into that book creator template were some global connections. So for example, when we read Tough Forest, as you'll see in the corner, I created the Padlet board. Um, along with that, tried to bring in those curricular pieces. For example, in my district, first graders work on character traits. And so when they read Tough Forest, they created a pic collage of themselves that told their character traits. And then that's what they shared out on that Padlet board. So it was still curricular related, um, and yet they were still able to connect globally. So we had a Padlet board. We also had a Flipgrid board that students were able to um, jump on as well and leave a video comment sharing what their favorite book was from, from the Global Read Aloud and why they chose that book. 
Um, and it was absolutely amazing how many people um, jumped on and the students enjoyed seeing each other and people from all over the world as well. So just a really, really neat opportunity. The books for this next year are already out. So if you check the Global Read Aloud website, um, you will find what you need to know there. I highly encourage you to try it out. It is just an amazing experience and, again, brings um, global connections right into the curriculum. This is another piece that we had added on to Global Read Aloud, too. Um, as I mentioned, Epic Pals Running, we did a special one for um, MemFox. And then within that, Padlet board had um, different things that students could use on the shelf format of things they wondered about, things that they liked, questions they may have had for MemFox, et cetera. Um, and again, just a way to get, get students talking about reading from each other and, and connecting. Uh, just another, I dabbled a little bit with adding some um, quotes that are meaningful to me, and I think this one is so true, too. Tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. Bringing your kids on and globally connecting involves them in so many ways. And as I mentioned with the newbie question, with the Texas tornadoes, um, what my students learned and retained and talked about when we would reflect back throughout the year never ceased to amaze me. It, it wasn't the, the math lesson where, where you brought in the graham crackers and put the frosting on them and, and talked about, you know, doubles fact. It was the connections and the people that always came back into our conversations. So that being said, I've mentioned Flipgrid already. Flipgrid, um, if you've not investigated it too, I highly encourage you to. Um, and, and I will say too, Padlet is adding a lot of pieces right now that Padlet and Flipgrid have a lot of similarities. Um, you'll kind of have to pick and choose what you feel works best for you. I tend to kind of go back and forth with both. But Flipgrid is just an amazing um, resource for students to be able to use to leave those video reflections. And again, the, the thing that I love most about it is they can actually see each other. Back in the day of Padlet, you know, even several months ago, it was just the sticky notes, if you will. Uh, Padlet has now added the ability to do video as well. Uh, but Flipgrid is so, so easy to use, easily accessible by even kindergartners. And I have used it with kindergartners. And I think that's one of the things that keeps continuing to draw me back. Um, but again, looking at how to connect globally, I had put together a Flipgrid board for Martin Luther King Jr. Day and put together several topics and tried to find pieces that were a bit more age appropriate. So each topic then had a video for students to watch related to Martin Luther King. And there was also a question that went along with that. And then students were able to leave their reflections. Um, I put it out on Twitter, shared it out that way, um, put it out in the Flipgrid um, library area and thought that mainly it would be the people in my school that would use it as I shared it out on the Tech Bytes newsletter as well. And I was beyond amazed when we had 970 videos within a week. Um, I had started out moderating all of them. And after about the second day, I decided that I couldn't keep up any longer and wasn't able to moderate them all. Um, but they kept coming. And it was just amazing to listen to what students felt and the passion that they had. And there were some that, that really struck me in a way that I wouldn't have thought that, that a fourth or a fifth grader would be thinking. Um, and it was really just quite amazing. It, it really opens that door for students to put their opinions out as well. Read Across America Day, we did something similar. We put together a flip grid. And again, very, very simple to do, whether it is that you're just connecting between classrooms in your own building, whether it is that you're sharing it out on Twitter, whether you're sharing it with just a, a buddy class that you may have somewhere else. Uh, Read Across America Day, we simply put together several topics for different Dr. Seuss books, and again, have students reflect on those books. So for example, green eggs and ham was something as simple as, would you eat green eggs and ham on a boat or with a goat? And why or why not? Um, really just trying to get even our youngest students to be able to jump on and connect and collaborate. Um, I already mentioned connecting within your school as we talk about you know, global connections, oftentimes it's easy to just start those connections within your school. Um, it's an easy first step to do. Um, it, it's amazing how, uh, depending on how large your school is, the school that I used to teach first grade in, we were a school of about 550. Uh, we were a two-story building spread out on a fairly large campus. And really, the, the kindergartners didn't have much to do with the rest of us. They had their own wing. First grade, we had our own little area. Third, fourth, and fifth was upstairs, so they were kind of their own community. 
And the crossover didn't happen as much as they would have loved it to. And so something as simple as putting a flip grid or a pads board together and inviting students just within your own building to connect really can open doors in just a starting point. Um, as I mentioned, and you may have seen on several of the slides, global collaboration, it, it's not an extra. It, it's really a true embedding of those curricular objectives, and I'm very passionate about that. Um, it, it, sh it needs to fit in. It's, it's just not that fluff piece. So one of the things that's happening in one of my buildings right now that impacts Hillcrest is our music teacher is getting ready for her spring concert. Wanted students to have a say in the impact that, that they have on the world or want to have on the world, um, what they want to leave as their legacy or their impact at the school that we're at. And she started a foot grip with all of these uh, various topics and had students go on and leave their responses on that foot grid. Um, for the concert then, we're taking those, we're downloading those videos, putting them in an iMovie, and we're going to be using that iMovie um, to show parents prior to the concert and through our transition um, areas in the concert as well. And the students are just so excited because they have ownership over this. 100th day of school, another very, very easy way. Um, we use Padlet in my classroom. Flipgrid we tried this year. It was fantastic. Um, it's neat to see students see, um, and I'll jump back just a little bit, and I'll give a, a, an example before I share this. Um, in my classroom, we did Padlet one year, and we wanted to get 100 posts on our Padlet board for the 100th day of school. And so we started by sharing it out just within our school, as I mentioned, and we didn't quite make it to 100. And so from there, we sent it out to parents and asked parents to share with others as well. And, and really, as kind of a secondary reason, we wanted parents to try some of the technology that their students were using in school as well. Um, but it was great because during transition times, I would pull it up on the smart board so that we could see it happening live. And lo and behold, one of the little gals in my classroom had an aunt that lived in Kansas. And as we were watching it during our snack break, her aunt in Kansas was putting her Padlet post up. And the little gal was watching as the Padlet went up. And she said, oh my goodness, that's my aunt. And she was so excited. So again, bringing that ownership in. Um, just just amazing. So again, connecting your school involves parents, bring it out to families. You can start in those in those smaller environments and, and let it grow. Um, this is the one, as I mentioned earlier, that I have not had um, a personal connection with. It is something that just started up recently. Um, it is called Grid Pals, and it utilizes Flipgrid. Um, way back in the day, as I said, I've been teaching for um, a little over 20 years now. We would do pen pals, or what we now refer to as stale pals, um, from the standpoint of we would write a letter and you'd be lucky to get something back two months later by the time you'd get through the writing process and put it in the mail and get the letters. Um, and it was very frustrating for first graders because they want things instantly. Um, so grid pals came about, and I forgot to put the lady's name on here that started it, but I know that if you click on the link, um, it is there. Um, started out with wanting to take that pen pal idea and bring it um, to Flipgrid, and Grid Pals is what has come from that. And so the way to set up, if you click on the link, there is a Google form. Um, you simply put some information in about your class, your grade level, where you're located. If you want a class at a similar grade level, um, US or not, and then they will pair you up with another class. So again, it is, it's really more personalized in that way, as it's just you in one other classroom. Um, a phenomenal way to connect you don't have to worry about time zones. You don't have to worry about, you know, getting things done and sending out the mail and having that wait time or things getting lost. Um, it is something that I just recently shared with my teachers, and I'm excited um, that some will hopefully jump on board next year. Obviously, for us, we're wrapping up our school year here in the next five to six weeks. Um, might not be the best time to jump on, but um, I've got some teachers that have already mentioned that they're excited to give that a try. So I wanted to share that as well with you. Um, Projects by Jen, I, I know some of you in the chat have mentioned that you have participated in Projects by Jen. I'll um, be honest, Jen Wagner is the one that started Projects by Jen. She, if I remember correctly, is out of California. Love, love, love her, can't say enough about her. She is probably the person when I found her website that got me really started with getting my class to that next level. Not just me personally on Twitter, but taking my class out there. She has some phenomenal, phenomenal projects. I know for a while she was running seven or eight a year while still teaching. Um, do not know how she managed all of that plus teaching, but she has since scaled back. But one of her projects that I know is happening currently is called the Picture It Project. Just a neat way to bring in um, the connection, but also art. 
she has a piece of art each year that they choose. The particular year that you're looking at here um, was the year that my class did it. it was Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh. And what she does is she pairs you up with 24 different classes. And then that piece of artwork is split into 24 different grid sections. So my kiddos got one of the 24 pieces. And then they each colored that one piece. So we had 24 identical pieces colored, however those students chose to do it. And then in this case, it was snail mailed out to the other 23 classrooms. Those classrooms had done the same and mailed us their pieces so that in the end, we had all 24 pieces from 24 different classrooms to be able to create Vincent Van Gogh's piece um, with a global connection. Um, neat, neat way along with it, Jen always had a, um, a paper that we would fill out that talked about our class, how many kids we had, a little something about our building. Um, just another great way to connect and talk about others and, and where they're from. So we would pull the map down every time we would get mail. The kids would get excited. We would um, embed math skills into it when we'd find out that the class had 18 students and nine were boys. Well, how many were girls then? So it always had that curricular connection coming back to it. She also um, had opportunities for Twitter collaboration as well as Skype and Google Hangout if you were willing to do that or felt comfortable with that. And so there were times with her projects too that we would also connect with others and talk with them about their schools more so beyond just the project itself. Um, so yeah, Jen has been hosting for a long time. I see Peggy just put a note in the chat about that. Um, just, just phenomenal. So saying that about projects by Jen, as I mentioned to you, she scaled back just a little bit. One of the projects that she ran was the um, Lucky Charms graphing project. And this was a phenomenal one um, for our K3 kiddos as it was capped for K3. And this is one of the ones that she had scaled back on. My class participated in this one every single year. This, this was great for us for graphing skills, addition skills, um, analyzing data. It, it fits so many curricular standards in the first grade classroom that I was sad to see it go. Um, so she had put a note out just saying, if anybody's interested in taking it over, please let me know. And I hemmed and hawed and thought, can I really do this? I don't know if I'm ready to take it to the next level. Um, but it killed me to let it go. And so I contacted her and said, I'll do it. <laughs> what do I need to do? Um, so lo and behold, with, within the course of about a two-week stretch before St. Patrick's Day, um, I took it over, built the website, got things up and ready to go. And I'm um, running it basically the exact same as Jen, putting it just a little different twist on it with, with some seesaw activities that could embed in and so on and so forth. So if you've taken part in the past and didn't realize that it was going again, please check us out. Um, Links are in the live binder. Um, we'd love to have you on board. We had 225 classes this year, um, which I couldn't have been more thrilled with, especially kind of being the, the maiden year and getting started with it. Um, I had many of my teachers take part in it. It is just a phenomenal opportunity to connect your students. Again, you can, you can keep it in the classroom if you want, but the magic happens when you take it out of your classroom. Um, and as you can see on the slide there too, the Google Hangouts, being able to connect in, um, really open up those doors. When my class would connect, we always connected with Mika DeGroote in Iowa, and we would compare our data. So when we would get online with each other, we would talk about how many stars did you have and how many did we have. We would talk about our data, you know, why do we think those things happen. Um, it, it, was just, it was a really great way to bring in those curricular pieces plus do the connecting. This year, one of the new pieces that we did bring on, like I said, I'm running it a lot like Jen did, but, but trying to bring that some more of those connecting pieces in. Um, Flipgrid, again, is one of those things that we brought on board. I had, um, I think it was Janie Hacken that reached out to me and said, hey, what about a Flipgrid? What do you think about that? And I was like, hey, absolutely. Got any ideas for topics? Let's, let's give it a try. So there's that professional connecting. And from there, we came up with several different topics. And um, again, brought in those math pieces. We had kids putting their lucky charms out to to share a math problem. So how many um, Lucky Charms pieces would I have if I had four blue moons and three pots of gold? And then students could get on and actually leave their video responses for those math projects. Um, and there were multiple other topics too. But again, getting them to use those curricular pieces, getting them to connect, getting them to comment with each other, really brought that connection piece to the forefront. We also had a collaborative slide deck, so just another way to collaborate where, where teachers could get on with their students and, and share some pictures of their class participating and tell us a little bit about their class. Again, all of these pieces were optional. You, you pick and choose 
um, what you feel works the best for your class and with the time that we have, because we, we certainly know time is precious within our classrooms. So again, finding that balancing act can sometimes be a tricky process. Um, stepping out, again, as I hope that passion is coming out because I truly can't stress this enough. Um, you may need to step out of your comfort zone to develop the kind of schools that our students need. Um, as I think about the way we used to teach and how things are changing and continuing to change, um, we truly need to change along with our kids. I often hear, and my husband um, cracks me up because he's one of these two and I have to keep telling him, no, 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 honey, really, things are changing. Um, because he will constantly say to me, well, you know, we learned and, you know, we turned out just fine. <laughs> so, um, I'm like, yes, honey, I, I think we did turn out just fine, but there's so much out there for the world, in the world, for students to experience. Um, and we are a global community. And so to have that empathy for each other and to step out of that, that zone really is huge. Um, Google Hangouts, and I put Meet here too. If you didn't realize, Google Hangouts is changing to Google Meet. Some of you may have already seen that and had that switch over for you. Some of you might still be um, using the Google Hangout piece if you haven't had that happen. Um, there are some phenomenal opportunities with Google Hangouts and Meet. Several of them I've already talked about where you can Anything that you're doing within your classroom is easy enough to reach out to somebody and have a connection. And Google Hangouts, or I should also say Skype or FaceTime as well. Um, our district happens to be a Google district, and so Hangouts is where we hang out usually. Um, but one of the, the things that we have been doing a lot of, um, mostly at fourth grade at this point for um, mystery location, because they, as part of their curriculum, study the state. Um, but we use Google Hangouts to connect with other classes across the US, and we play a game, if you will kind of like 20 questions called mystery location. And so the teachers or myself, if I'm helping them, we will um, make a connection. We do that via email or Twitter. Um, there's some Google Hangout communities as well that we use, and I have those in that live binder as well. Um, that when we then connect with each other, we ask each other questions. You know, are you west of the Mississippi or east of the Mississippi? Um, and then the kids, as you can see by the pictures here, have a map. They use those questions. Um, they're problem solving try and figure out where that state is and try to um, divvy it down. So in fact, our fourth grade just connected with a class in Alaska um, this past week. It was phenomenal. Um, so much to be learned, not only connecting and seeing students from around the world, um, but then at the end being able to ask questions about, well, you know, what do you do in your spare time? Or what time is it in Alaska? Our students were um, amazed to find out that we were eating lunch when we connected, and they were just starting their school day. The time difference was that much. So. It's really a neat way to connect kids. It brings that gamified piece into it. It's exciting for them. Um, one of the resources that I, I have included, Peggy put in the live binder, um, is a mystery location questions and resources doc that I use when I introduce it to students. And along with that document, we kind of, um, we play kind of a, um, a practice game, if you will, where I'll pick a state and not tell them and they then guess it. So feel free to use, utilize that resource. Um, as you see fit, and hopefully that'll help you if you want to, to jump out and give that a try. Um, I also have something that we started doing this year along with Mystery Location. Um, again, trying to take it to that next level for curricular reasons. I talked to my fourth grade teacher and said, well, hey, how about having a book creator template where your students can, um, can record where you, um, who you connected with? And so we put together this book creator template that when they are done, they will type in the state. They'll share some facts that they learned about the state, because we always share at the end some different things, like I mentioned. They can find the state on the map. So again, they're getting that curricular piece, their geography skills, finding the state on the map as well. And then they can audio any pieces that they want to add into that template. And then at the end of the year, they'll have their own, their own book creator book then based on that. So that book creator template is also in the live finder if you are at all interested in it. It is an EPUB, so you will need to download it um, from your it's in my Google Drive, but you'll have to download it into a book creator to be able to open it up and see it. Um, if you have issues with that, please reach out to me. I do have a, a workflow poster that I forgot to give to um, Peggy, and maybe Peggy, I can send that to you later, too, that you can add it to the live binder, but that'll help you get that. So once it's in book creator view, if you want to change anything, it's all editable. You can do as you want with it, but um, just another way to bring things in. On that same note, as a first grade teacher, um, we did a little bit of mystery location, but it it was a little bit trickier for us, but we did do it. But our big one was um, mystery numbers. So we would connect with classes 
and we would use our number grid, so bringing our place value skills in, and we would pick a number from 1 to 100, as would the other class, and then we would use that 20 question format to try and figure out what their, their number was. Um, again, um, there's a resource, that purple box that you're seeing there um, is a Google slide deck that I would use to introduce it to kids. That is available for you, so please feel free to use that. Um, but then what we did is we would have a um, anchor chart in the room. And so as we would guess back and forth, um, students would again use those place value skills that they had to try and figure out what that mystery number was. So is your number odd or even? And it's always yes questions and no questions. And for first graders, that was always interesting. It took them a while to realize they couldn't say, um, is your number odd or even, for example, because it's only yes or no. So is your number odd? And um, it, it was a fun way, again, to bring in place value skills, math skills, having them connect. Um, students would always ask the questions of the other class, so they basically had those speaking and listening skills that also played into us using this. So um, there's also another resource here um, from Sarah Barnett. She has created some posters that she used for um, mystery number Skyping for reminders for her, for her kids. Like, don't forget to introduce yourself and so on. So there's a link for that there, too, for TPT, um, where she has those if you are interested. So where do you find connections? That's the piece that I always hear. Um, people always come in and say, well, OK, Melko, you know, you're on Twitter. Like, you're so highly connected. It's easy for you. And I always laugh and say, you know, I, I wasn't always as connected as I was. Um, it takes time and there's a process to get there, um, but where do you start? And so what I found, especially for the Mystery Hangouts, these three particular Google communities have been just wonderful. Um, they are all linked in the Live Finder for you as well. It's as easy as getting on and either looking to find somebody that's looking for a time that matches up with you or a grade level that matches up with you, or even simpler to put your own post out and say, hey, we're a fifth grade classroom. We're looking to do a hangout sometime this particular week. 2.30 to 3.30 works best for us. And then somebody will see that. They'll send you um, a post back. And then we always take it over to email from that point to start those connecting pieces and put the specifics together. Works wonderfully. Um, I will say these are very active communities. Um, I just worked with a fifth grade teacher this week to set up um, a connection for her for next week and literally within 24 hours I had a response from somebody saying yep we're in let's let's work on it so um, just a very very easy way simple to do Twitter as I've mentioned is, is a place I love to hang out and I've mentioned Lika DeGroote's name already um, today during the webinar she's a first grade teacher from Iowa who again um, feels very similarly to me as far as um, connecting her students beyond the four walls of her classroom and she started, oh gosh, I, I hate to say for sure, but I want to say it might even be five years ago, a book club via Twitter for the book My Father's Dragon. So my class um, took part in this. It was amazing. The way it worked is you would read a chapter of the book in your own classroom every day. Lika would put a question out on Twitter each and every day for the classes to ponder and then to respond back to. So in essence, it was a slow chat via Twitter. Um, along with that, many of us would connect with each other through Google Hangouts, Skype, FaceTime, those sorts of things. Um, and sometimes with the connections, too, we would even have students, for example, make connections. They would draw pictures. We would take pictures and add those up onto Twitter as well. So um, in my classroom, my students all individually tweeted. A lot of people will ask me along those lines, well, how did you do that with first graders? They're six, and I can't have a Twitter account. Um, I had one classroom Twitter account separate from my um, S. Malco, and I had our iPads logged in with that Twitter account. So in essence, I still owned it. If something went out that shouldn't have, I could very easily delete it. And then the way we did that is students would type up their tweet, and when they had it ready to go, they would come and check in with me. So we could just double check it before they would tweet it out. So it went out from a classroom Twitter account, um, but it always had teacher eyes that went on it prior to it going out. So. Um, again, just a neat way, very easy to set up. Um, pick a book, put a tweet out, and say, hey, is anybody interested? We're going to read a chapter a day. Great, easy way to connect. Um, if you want to see more, um, her hashtag for this year was um, 1BC18, which stands for 1 for first grade book club, and then the year 18. And that's how she does all of them. So if you'd like to look back, you can dig into that a bit more. Um, Lika also. Um, 
does a slow chat for first grade called MTGR1. It's math task grade one. And she'll post a picture out on Sunday night. Very, very open-ended. It simply is students looking at this picture and what math do you see in the image. So whether that be I see 10 pink flowers and eight umbrellas, the total would be, however they do that, um, it gives them an opportunity to put their math skills to work while also connecting with others. Um, there are also other grade levels. I think there's, um, I think one of our, our buddies is still doing an MTGR2, and there might be an MTGR3 that are still going on as well. But I know Lika has done this for a while and is still going strong with it. Um, on that same exact note, some of you may have heard of the Global Math Task Twitter Challenge. So it's a hashtag GMTTC. That is the main hashtag, but then there are um, sub pieces, if you will, for each grade level. Um, just a fantastic, fantastic way, again, to connect your students. It brings math in. Um, the way that they put theirs together is a classroom will volunteer to host the questions each week, if you will. So when my class participated in this, we did Valentine's Day. On Monday through Friday, we had a different post for each day of the week that had something math related to do with Valentine's Day. And then we would push that out for our, our tweet for the day. Classes would answer with a hashtag. And then we could check in, for example, at snack time to see who had posted back to us, check answers, you know, wonder about different things that they were wondering, answer them back if they had questions. It was just a really neat way to get the kids involved. And again, not taking too much of our learning time away, we would do it during our snack time, which then brought our snack time to be a little bit more um, productive instead of behaviors and craziness and spilled milk and all that good stuff at first grade level. So um, again, just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. I highly recommend checking it out. They also have one, um, if you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, it's GMTTC24. And basically, it's a, um, it's a game of 24. Four numbers that are shared at the beginning of the week. You need to tweet out different ways of creating that number with the four numbers, whether you add, subtract, however that may look. So really, a lot of critical thinking and problem solving for kids, bringing, again, those curricular pieces on board. Virtual field trips. I know in our district, um, and I'm sure in many of yours, if not all of yours, budgets are a huge issue. And it seems like there's just never enough money to get all the things that we want or need sometimes, for that matter, too. Um, and so I've really been looking for ways to be able to reach out and branch out and bring students to places that we normally wouldn't be able to go. Um, there are many, many, many ways to do that. Lots of virtual field trips that are available. But I, again, really wanted that connecting piece to go along with it, not just Here's a YouTube video of the butterflies in Mexico and sitting and watching it. I wanted that interactive piece to go with it. Um, and so what I found were two um, just phenomenal, phenomenal sites. Um, this one is called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. My class, when I was in first grade, connected with a scientist, Jean um, Pennycook, who you see there, who was a scientist in Antarctica who was studying penguins. So my class actually got to go to Antarctica virtually live with um, Jean Penny Cook and got to hear her talk about her research and got to see penguins live. It was just a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. So the way it, the way it works is they will open it up every month. Um, they'll have different um, virtual field trips available. And then there are always six camera spots. And so if you are one of the first ones to sign on, you get one of those camera spots. It is done um, usually via Google Hangouts. And then you are able to actually ask questions of the person that you are connecting with. They will answer back. Um, and if you aren't able to get a camera spot, they do have a chat window like we do today, too, where you can ask questions and many times still get answers. So just a, a really neat way to connect kids in to um, scientists, um, different museums, et cetera. Um, my kids, too, when we were doing it, as you can see here, again, to bring that curricular piece in as they were learning. Um, I had, they had their iPads and they were able to use drawing pad and draw a picture of some of the things that they found interesting. Um, this little guy found it very interesting that penguins actually will leave their area for two to three days to go and find food. And then they shared that information out and tweeted that out as well to connect further beyond our classroom again. Um, another site very similar to Exploring by the Sea is called Learn Around the World. Um, set up very, very similarly in that there are live camera spots. Um, so again, you get to connect and communicate with those that you are with. Um, just a fantastic, fantastic site. And I know I've said that a lot for all these things, but there's the passion. I'm sorry, that comes out. All of these things are wonderful. Um, 
But recently they did one on magnificent monarchs and the monarchs that uh, migrate down to Mexico. Our second grade classes here do a huge unit on butterflies and their life cycle and they talk about the migration. And we've seen pictures of it and even just seeing the pictures, it, it's amazing. But to actually take part in it live and truly see it firsthand um, was simply unbelievable. And again, being able to ask those questions. Um, this gentleman also sometimes will bring on live cahoots where you actually can do a cahoot before you start. Um, just really stretching the limits and doing some neat things. The really amazing part though too, again, um, if you're not able to make it based on the time zone pieces, he also does archive his presentations onto his YouTube channel. And so you can go back and watch them as well. So I personally like to do them live. I like that connected piece, but sometimes the time zone um, pieces just don't fit. So that being said, a lot of those things were for students, but so often we as educators, I think, forget that we too need to be connected and, and to be able to network with others because it really truly will change um, and, and reshape how you teach. So that being said, um, I have just a few resources here for you that uh, um, may be helpful for you. Um, one of the things Peggy mentioned earlier is something that I started this year. Um, I do teach in two buildings, and so I'm only in each of my buildings two and a half days a week. And I struggled last year in my position um, with the fact that I'd be in one building and would hear about something, and I would share it with those teachers. And when I would get to my other building on Wednesday, would totally have forgotten about it, and they never got the opportunity to hear of whatever that experience might have been. And so I needed to find a way to connect both of my buildings. So my solution to that this year is what has turned into my labor of love. It is called Melko's Tech Bytes. It is a weekly newsletter, if you will, that I put out that as I find uh, various activities, um, again, try very hard to keep it curricular related. Um, it is really geared uh, 4K through 5 at the elementary level, although there are always um, bits and pieces and tidbits that you can take really to any grade. Um, but it comes out weekly. I do put it out on Twitter. It's also posted on my blog. You can subscribe to it, so it'll come directly to your email. Um, and again, it's, it's just a variety of um, tips, tidbits, sites, ways that you can connect globally, um, just the whole variety. So if it's something that you're interested in, or maybe you're at that point yet and you're saying, you know, I, I'm just not sure like what's out there. You don't know what you don't know. Um, this might be a great starting point for you. So feel free to check it out and um, let me know if you ever have suggestions or things that you would like to see on it because I'm, I'm always looking for new things. I think I'm on volume, I think 32 went out today and there's still plenty more, but again, any recommendations are always appreciated. Um, I also have, for those of you that are Seesaw users, um, put together a Seesaw activity template slide deck for my uh, teachers in my district. And then from there I thought, well, really, why am I just sharing this with the teachers in my district? Um, Anybody can benefit from this. And so this too is you know, available for you to go on. It is just a variety of CESA activities that either I have created or um, several other phenomenal teachers that are all collated into this area. It's all put together by content areas. You can click and go to the content area that you're looking for and kind of dabble and find. So um, again, it's just a resource that's there for you. Enjoy. And then as I mentioned earlier, I also have um, my blog. Um, all the things, most of the things that we've talked about today are there. Um, Tech Bytes goes there every single week. Um, and as I'm doing things within classrooms, I've fallen behind just a little bit, but as we do things, um, for example, we just did a Mother's Day project using green screen. As we do those kinds of things from a tech integration perspective, I try to post about those too and give those ideas and the workflow of how we do certain things if you're looking for some of those tech integration ideas as well. So that being said, I think we're right at the end. Um, these are some of the places that you can um, find me. Again, I love to connect. I'm very passionate about it. Um, Twitter is probably the fastest and easiest way to find me. Um, email would probably be the second best, but please feel free to reach out to me. If there's anything that you have questions about, I would love to chat with you. So with that, um, Peggy, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Sarah. I did manage to capture a few questions. If anybody has any others, please type them in chat. And this goes back to the Epic Pals uh, videos. 
do you moderate each of the comments made? And that was before you said you, you had to stop moderating for one project. Yes, with Epic Tales, I um, was moderating for quite some time and have found that students, because um, it's just the primary boards, that students have been very respectful and I have mm -hmm. not moderated. I haven't found the need to at this point. Um, mm -hmm. I do go on and watch them though, and if there is something that I um, do wonder about, I will take it off, but I'll be honest, I haven't had anything as of yet. Great. Um, are your flip grids open to all? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Those are the questions I saw. Again, if anyone has any others, you can type them in chat. A couple people typing, so we may have some other questions. Do you have any ideas how many different classrooms you have connected with? Oh gosh, I would say, especially in that position now where I'm helping other teachers to connect as well. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sure we're probably probably well over a hundred. Wow. Yes, this is recorded, Nora. The link will be available sometime later today. Can you say more about Epic Books for Kids mm -hmm. and how that works? Yes, absolutely. So Epic Books for Books for Kids is a website and an app. Um, it is free for teachers. It is. Um, Basically, it's an, it's an e-book library, if you will, with some phenomenal books. It's, um, there are many, many books. Uh, Big Nate is on there, for example. There are some Robert Munch books, so some, some good quality literature. Um, again, it's free for, for teachers. You just have to sign up, and then you can set it up so that your class of kids each will have their own account within your teacher account. Mm -hmm. um, kids do not need an account then. Super easy to use. Um, with Epic Pals in that regard, we build a collection every month, and so you can add that collection to your library, if you will, and you can push it out to your students, so they just have to touch on the book and it will open it for them. Um, but again, just phenomenal. It is somewhat gamified, and students love that. The more books they read, the more points they earn, they can level up, they earn badges. Um, just highly encourage you to check it out. Just a fantastic site. They're constantly adding, I think at last count, they had... Oh gosh, I want to say it's like over 15,000 books, if I remember correctly. Um, and again, K, K, I think it's eight, up to age 12, actually. Okay, thank you. And thanks so much for presenting today. I think everybody learned a lot. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy. We will talk about the virtual conference coming up and tell us what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Sarah. I knew we would be excited, but this is beyond excited. You have shared so many great resources and ideas, and it's really good that this is recorded because we can go back and pause it and, and check things out in the live binder, but we can also share it with other teachers. So thanks a lot. I do want to tell everyone about this wonderful opportunity. It's coming up the end of May, May 19th through the 21st. The 4T virtual conference has been going on for quite a few years, maybe at least seven. And I think this is the last year. It's totally free. And the link is in the live binder. It's 4TVirtualCon.com. All you have to do is sign up, so you'll get the reminder notices with the links to join the sessions, and then you'll have access to all of the recordings. It runs for three or four days. Um, I go to it every year, and it's always fantastic. So uh, put that on your radar and try to join in if you can. We also have some terrific shows coming up. Next week, we have the amazing Michael Fricano, who 
if you don't know him, you're going to want to be here because he is the ultimate guru on everything related to virtual reality, augmented reality, and Google expeditions. So he's going to be sharing that with us next week. Then the following week, Brandy Ramirez is going to do a great presentation on balanced literacy and technology. She's calling it Creating the Perfect BLT. You know that wonderful sandwich. And then no show on Memorial Day weekend in the United States, but on, um, and we're still finalizing plans for June 2nd. June 9th, we have the awesome Kim Strobel joining us. She's going to be talking about science of happiness and its impact on school culture. And it'll certainly be about how happiness impacts our own lives. So I know that's going to be great. And then we'll have our final webinar before summer break and before ISTE on June 16th. And we're anticipating that will be another open mic show where we can all share our summer PD plans, our summer bucket list, and we hope you'll all plan to come and join us. It's always a really fun conversation that we have. And then we'll return after our summer break on August 4th. So thanks again to all of you for joining us today. Come back every Saturday you can, and hope to see you next week. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar. And if you sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session, as long as it's open to the public, it is free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this site or from within the live binder. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month. The video collection from the recordings are available in iTunes U and YouTube. As you exit the session, the survey should open up and you can request a professional development certificate thanks to Patty Ruffing who sends these out as well as uh, your name is printed on them. Make sure you use a personal email address to request this. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Here's the direct link for the survey. You can take the link from the chat or the live binder. Again, when you exit the session, this should open up in your browser automatically. Special thanks again to our special guest, Sarah Malko, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.